There are more than 2 million people in U.S. prisons and jails today. If you include all those on probation or parole, over 7 million American citizens are under correctional supervision. That should be a troubling figure to every American. No other country has so many people behind bars. But here's an even more troubling figure. More than 40% of those who are eventually released end up back in prison within three years. That's four out of every 10 offenders. Our high recidivism rates are the real hidden tragedy of the U.S. correction system. They add to the pain of families and communities and to our tax burden. Can we break the cycle of tragedy? Experts say it's long past time for a new approach to crime and punishment in America. And they're looking for bold new ideas. Angel Ramos could help them. Angel has spent more than half his life in maximum security prisons around New York State. Today, he attends John Jay College, where he's studying for a degree in public administration. His life turned around in 1989 when he wandered into a Quaker meeting in Eastern Correctional Facility in Ulster County. Over the next two decades, Angel became an active prison member of the Religious Society of Friends, or Quakers as they are often called. By the time he was released in 2007, he was re-equipped, he says, with the spiritual tools that helped him readjust to life on the outside. Angel joins us today on Criminal Justice Matters to kick off a discussion about the role that religion is playing in our correction system today and to help us explore whether the faith-based community can be part of the solution to America's incarceration tragedy. So, Ankel, were you a religious man before you went to prison? I suppose I grew up religious. I remember, well, I, used, I usually tell the story is that when I was a child, I loved God. And then when I hit about my 10, I got angry at God. And then when I hit my teens, I stopped talking to God. And in my 20s, into my 30s, I just begrudged God his existence. Mm -hmm. And then one day I had a conversation with God. I said, okay, you could can, you can be here, but I'm not, still not talking to you. So what happened that day in 1989? You were in prison already for 15 years or 10 years? Yeah, something? I was in prison for a while. You know, I, you know, I built my mind, you know, Brad Thoreau and Emerson and all that in the search of trying to find out who I was, because I never knew who I was. Still don't. Um, and someone asked me, I was walking in and somebody said, listen, why don't you come to a Quaker meeting with me? And I'm like, oh, okay, I got nothing to do. So I went to a Quaker meeting and I'm sitting there and I'm, I come, I'm a, uh, I'm a recovering Catholic. I'm sorry, I don't mean to offend anyone, but that's how I look at it. Um, and so I'm waiting for a ceremony and we're sitting and I'm waiting, well, when, is the, when is this going to start? And we're sitting there in silence and meditation and I'm like, it's kind of freaking me out because I'm waiting for a service because I'm used to that. And uh, none of that happened. And so I didn't return for a while because I couldn't understand, like, that was a service? Like, what was that about? But uh, I went again later on, about six months later, because I, I was working as a clerk in the, in, the, you know, in the Catholic services. And then I left that job. I went again and then met someone. Uh, I, used, I usually call the little old lady in the white dress. And I couldn't believe, I couldn't believe I've never met the salt of the earth. Mm -hmm. You know, people that are good, honest, decent people that, you know, they have no, they, violence is the last thing in their mind. They would never think of hurting you because that's not the first thing that comes to their mind. And at first I thought, they got to be a con. Nobody's as good, you know. And of course, because you know, I'm living in, with a bunch of convicts, you know, everybody's trying to get over on everybody and trying to hurt you and trying to get, you know, everybody's afraid really, but, you know, everybody's puffed up trying to stay away from me or I'm tough, you know. So they got that old thing going on. So, of course, you're in it and that, you're in that same dynamic. And I'm sitting there and this woman doesn't care what I did, doesn't care, uh, you know. All she wanted to know was, hi, how are you? Who are you? And, yeah, I'm here and please come and share the silence with me and how are you and how's your life? And, you know, you know there's a part of God in you that... Uh, yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, we're not talking about sort of an instant conversion. All of a sudden, no, 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 you went I'm, from what black I'm, to white. But no, no, what, what I'm were talking you, about. Were you leading towards that to begin with? No, I mean, what I'm, how did actually, it get? My, you know, uh, I had spent that time up to that point. Uh, I had gone to school and, uh, you know, tried to get some education at Thoreau and Emerson and all that stuff, trying to, like I said, trying to figure out who I was. And, you know, just lifting weights, you know, so I was physically in good shape. But I realized my... I had no spirit. My spirit was broken. It was dead for all intents and purposes. That's what prison is. It's the death of the soul through boredom. 
you know, you don't see it happening because it happens over a long time. And just that speaking with her reawakened something. I knew I was missing something. You know, just I kept going back because it was like there was something I needed. And I wasn't getting it in, in the religious services I was attending because I was attending as a child. It was more, you know, I'm going to church because I've been going to church as a kid and I'm just going. You know, I really something don't believe. you had to do. With it. Yeah, it was one of those, you know, just things you do just out of road, not really thinking, why am I doing this? And uh, so I started going to Quaker services and realized that um, I went, my, the, the most important part of myself I had neglected for so long. And so, you know, I started reading that, I started reading uh, the material and realized at some point along that journey, realized this is what I want to be. I've always wanted to be, I never wanted to be a bad guy. I was always in trouble, but I never really wanted to be a bad guy. I always wanted to be a good person. But you didn't get into uh, religion or the Quakers just because so you, you figured it would shorten your time. I mean, no, was there any idea it doesn't have no impact whatsoever. No. In fact, they could care less the state of New York. You know, in this country, we claim to be a... Uh, uh, religious country, but we don't believe in uh, redemption of people, which is like the strangest thing ever. Which is what prison is supposed to be. Well, it's supposed to be a rehabilitation, but if you've never been habilitated to begin with, how can you really do anything with that? So that's, you know, they start off badly. You couldn't design this system if you wanted to. I don't think there's a madman alive that could design the prison system the way it exists today at all. I'm not, you know, I think outside the box and I'm very imaginative, but I couldn't imagine this. This is... You know, it's, it's insane. It's an insane project. Do you think a lot of the guys who are in there with you would have been helped the same way? Or are they all um, susceptible to, if they found religion or some sort of spiritual faith, that it might have helped them um, a little bit better? Or is it, well, is, it some, is it something that's very obviously individual? Well, I've seen, you know, I've seen guys, you know, um, come in and out. You know, you do 30 years, you see the same guy come in and out, in and out, you know, repeating the same problems. Uh, you realize... Later on, there's a lot of issues connected with, you know, recidivism, job, uh, you know, we get beat, you know, I'm, uh, I can never get rid of my crime. I'm always the next con, no matter where I am, no matter how good I am, I could, I could cure cancer. And the society still, I still have that label on me. And somebody will always ask, have you ever been convicted of a crime? Like, what does it matter? I served my time. I'm, you know, I'm paying taxes. You know, I'm supporting you, by, by the way. You know, mm -hmm. so, but it's, you know, but I think when you find, most of us are broken. You know, we're all broken in one way or another. Our parents, our grandparents, they all that comes down to families. It's one thing or another. Um, but the only thing that really helps is your spirit has to be alive. And but here's the, I guess here's the, the, the essential question. I mean, obviously, spirituality did a lot for you. But do you think that would be the particular reason that you didn't go back to prison? Or would you have, if you hadn't found the Quakers, if you hadn't found some spiritual solace, um, you would have been right back in prison, or you were already on the on the on the no. line to be coming straight again. No, How much I, of a? I think I think had I not, had I not been had I not been a Quaker, it would have been very easy return. Oh really? Yeah, I actually I've actually had that conversation because I was, I went to the Fortune Society and I was at the castle for a while, and we have group meetings and stuff like that. And one day I actually said that in a meeting, uh, you know, if it wasn't that I had some a reason not to, a reason to think before I acted. A reason to say, well, you know, that's not really who you want to be. You know, even though you're still in that mode, you're still, you know, because when you go in, you put in a shield to protect yourself from this insanity because you're living in an insane place, you know. And uh, you put on this, you don't even know that you've put on this mask and this mm -hmm. suit of armor to protect your, yourself. And so when you come out, you still have this. And you, you start taking it off, but you realize that some, that, that you're, what do you feel about people? How do you think about yourself? is very important, and I think that's mostly a spiritual thing, not really an intellectual thing. And I'm thinking, I don't understand why there's not more, uh, it's not encouraged, actually it's discouraged, religion and all that, in prison, which is like, come on, what are you, nuts? But, you know, that's a society spending trillions of dollars fighting a war that they're never going to win against human nature. Akhil, thanks so much for being with us today. Okay, my pleasure. Thank you. Mixing religion and prison isn't new. In fact, the idea of using prisons as a form of redemption was championed by religious reformers as far back as the 18th century. In the 1970s, organizations like the Evangelical Prison Fellowship, started by the late Watergate felon Charles Colson, have attracted widespread attention. But can faith communities really make a difference and help reduce the numbers of prisoners across the nation? And are they worth encouraging with more taxpayers' support? To help us answer these questions, we're delighted to welcome a John Jay professor 
who has been deeply involved in both prison ministry and prisoner reentry. Professor Kimura teaches corrections and ethics and is educational director for treatment and prevention services at the Osborne Association in the Bronx. She's also an ordained minister. Welcome, Kimura, and welcome back, Anjal. So, Professor Kimura, what's the evidence that faith-based initiatives work? Well, there's some evidence out there that we can look at that basically um, comes from the fact that back in 2000, there was the Religious Land Use Act and Institutionalized Persons Act that was passed, and that protects prisoners' rights to exercise their religion. And as a result of that, there have been some studies done that look at pro-social educational programs. And there was one that was done by O'Connor, Ryan, Sakovich, and, and Parikai. Let me spell that for you, P-A-R-I-K-H. And in 1997, they looked at 23 inmates who recently attended Prison Fellowship Bible Program. And the women in these particular sessions in this maximum security prison said that, quote, religious programs were more helpful than their family, their friends, work, education, and psychiatric programs uh, for adjusting to prison life. Uh, similarly, they did interviews with 35 female inmates in a medium security prison in the Midwest uh, done by Greer, G-R-E-E-R, -E -E in 2002. And they found that religious experiences reportedly helped 16 of the women address the emotional discord that they felt while they were in prison. Several women stated that their belief in a higher power had actually helped them to get along better in life. Um, and during a, finally, during a focus group with 15 African-American mothers in a Midwestern prison, many of the women reported, quote, depending on their spirituality to make sense of their imprisonment and provide hope for the future. And that's from Stringer, 2009. Um, in terms of recidivism, it's really hard to check. Okay, when you mentioned the Prison Fellowship, which we talked about at the opening, now that the subtext of the Prison Fellowship, and they admit it straight out, is that they do, they're evangelical Christian, yeah. and they do want people to um, convert. They want people to come along their way. So when we talk about faith based initiatives, are we talking about a conversion program that that's going to make it, that's going to help you uh, readjust the life outside, or is it something else? Well, it can be interpreted different ways. And basically, the Bush Initiative in 2003 was basically set out to basically provide services for people, transitional services, and that if they were providing some kind of faith-based learning in prison, that that would help them. For example, if you look at Ready for Reentry, which is an organization that comes from the U.S. Labor Department, they have employment services, they've got transitional services, but while people are in prison, they can uh, practice their faith. In fact, uh, you know, the, the act that I mentioned at the beginning protects that. But it's not the idea that people are supposed to basically try to convert Angel or somebody else to something. But it's a fine line, isn't it? I mean, Angel, Angel when you were in, um, nobody was telling you that you, you made the decision to join the Friends. But, uh, and the Friends, of course, are not necessarily people who, who, who require conversion or, or push that, that um, particular point of view. But it's a fine line, isn't it, between saying, you know, um, faith is going to help you if you're already inclined that way and trying to get you to be a faith, uh, a member of a faith community. I don't know if conversion is a good idea. I don't think anybody should be converted to anyone, anything. You know, you either choose it or you don't. Um, I think it's important that people talk about that. At least you should at least examine that part of your life and that part of your being because it is a part of you. So, you know, and in that, in, in that respect, the state, which normally doesn't do that, should at least encourage that because it's helpful. It's just part of the mix. But still, what are we talking about? Are we talking about you know exclusively uh, religion classes like you have after school, or are we talking about a whole range of services that somehow incorporate mm -hmm. spirituality? I mean, how do you mm -hmm. how do you define what faith based initiatives actually are? That's a great question, Stephen. I think that based on the initiative. Faith-based really means talking about spirituality. Now, religious studies will be done. For example, somebody might study the New Testament, the Old Testament, the Quran, whatever. And the, the point we want to remember is that the, uh, the, the government allows, through this, people to practice their own religion. But there's, an, there's another aspect of this. I think Angel's right. I don't think anybody really uh, wants, uh, should be in there trying to convert people. I think that's a real problem when that happens. But if we can teach people spirituality, we teach them the power of connection with other people, the power of, of community and of having a sense of compassion instead of revenge. And those principles are 
uh, in all religions. Mm -hmm. But some faiths have a more powerful impact in prisons these days than others do. The, the fellowship, prison fellowship, was an evangelical, openly evangelical Christian um, um, community. Uh, Islam has has made huge inroads in 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 prisons area, and to some people say that's a danger because they talk about. Uh, um, uh, I don't have to explain. They talk about the dangers in that, that there may be Islamic uh, extremism that's taught in prisons. And others say, no, it's a very key part of what prisons should be doing because so many prisons are Islamic these days. I mean, but the fact that some, some faiths are more dominant than others in the prison community uh, sort of uh, or, or might, might kind of skew the, the results in some ways, wouldn't they? They would if that if that's happening, and I think what we want to remember is that it is dangerous to to proselytize in a sense like that. And um, you know, I mean, there there are several things going on here. One is that we want to guarantee that people have the right when they're incarcerated to practice their religion. That's very important. But um, if it strays and all of a sudden we have people acting in a manner that causes, let's say, fanatical behavior, then it's more dangerous. You know, that has some short-term uh, problems right away in a prison because we certainly don't want the people who are incarcerated to become more violent than the one they went in there. Mm -hmm. But if, if the goal of the faith-based organization is to get people to think in terms of spirituality, great. But I think what we need to understand too, Steve, is that it's more than just, let's say, having a session looking at a particular document that's religious. It's tying in r religious groups that come into the prisons and then say, you know, we're going to help somebody when the person gets out to find employment, to have some kind of transition. Oftentimes what we find is that the only connection, the only viable connection that many people who, who are incarcerated have is with some religious affiliation because that's what they had on the outside. Or that's what they come to later because they have some kind of epiphany that, wow, I think what I did was wrong and I need to change my ways. So it's, it's not just religion per se, it's connecting with the community on the outside from the inside, if that makes sense. Angel, how are people told about it inside? I mean, is there sort of a bulletin board which says if you want to go attend services in the Catholic Church or friend services, here's where you go. I mean, how are these made available to, actual, to prisoners inside? Well, religion is available to everyone, you know. Uh, the, the thing actual faith-based services. Well, faith -based. the faith-based services is more of a, I think it's, you know, I think she hit at something uh, which was really important. It's really tying yourself to the community when you get out, someone to talk to you. The, the job, I think, of religion in general is to teach you morality, right and wrong and stuff like that. The government doesn't do that. It teaches you math and science and all the rest of that and leaves that to the religious side. In prison, you need that. You need to have that discussion of ethics and what's right and what's wrong and why you're here. And if that doesn't, and because the institution doesn't give it, not allowing it or, or to, to encourage it makes sense. At least we have those conversations. It's available to everyone. Mm -hmm. I'm sorry. It's available to everyone, but not everybody. They, sometimes it's made difficult, let's say, to attend and stuff like that. You have to declare, I'm this today. And it's just, it's strange. It's so like, when you say it's made difficult, you mean to say that some prison authorities discourage it? Well, let's say, okay, uh, everybody has to have the, 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 if you sign up, let's say I'm Catholic, and I have to declare that I'm Catholic, so I can only attend Catholic services. So suppose you're having a, a fellowship meeting, and they're not Catholic, and they, you know, I want to go, I want to see what it's about, they're doing Bible study. I can't attend. That don't make no sense to me. You know, oh, I have to change my religion so I can attend that. That's like, you know, you're putting rules on something that shouldn't have rules. You should be encouraging it, not so much discouraging it. But I could see that security, you know, they have issues. You know, they, 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 it's a security issue. You don't want people getting together, making gangs. And, you know, it's, it's a kind of control chaos. You're trying to control chaos while you're trying to encourage good behavior. At the same time, you're trying to prevent what she was saying, you know, uh, people moving into the dark end. So are there limitations that need to be put on these faith-based initiatives inside prison at all? Well, I think yes, and I think one of the biggest points is something that I think you were alluding to, Angel, which is you don't want to force anyone mm -hmm. to have a certain belief system. You don't want somebody else telling you that and saying, well, we're not going to, we're not going to um, accept you if we don't do it. Um, I think that they do need to be watched because I personally, be, being an interfaith minister, believe that there's value in all religions. And I think that uh, it's very important to give people choice. You know, there's, there's still human beings, and they need to have some choice in life. 
I think a big part of it, obviously, is connecting on the outside. Once you get out, right. then how do you connect what you've learned spiritually inside prison to what you do on the outside? And this is where right. the whole issue of recidivism comes back. Now, you do a lot of work outside with prisoners who come out at the Osborne Association. Tell us a little bit about that. Right. Well, that's some great work at the Osborne Association because you're absolutely right, Steve. What we do at Osborne is, is connect families and uh, people who have been in, in prison with the families and also the communities through housing, through employment, through education. Uh, for example, the Osborne Association uh, received a, a grant several years ago uh, from the government and we now have what is called the Green Center and so we actually um, allow people who have come out of prison to, um, or in place of prison as, as a matter of probation, to actually sit in classes and learn basics about carpentry and, and those types of things and then find them jobs. And is faith done. one of those options that they have as part of it? It doesn't really come up. Um, but as, I will say this, that as a minister in that context, when I teach my, my groups to people, whether I'm at, um, uh, in the Bronx or I'm at Rikers or anywhere else, oftentimes uh, questions will come up because I know I'm a minister and so I will not try to sway them one way or another but say why don't you look at that text and see what it means. Well since uh, you know, the, the, the larger question for the rest of us is because of our, our focus that church and state should be separated in our mm -hmm. society. So the big question is how much should we be uh, supporting faith initiatives or faith-based initiatives or faith community either inside or outside prison. Since President Bush set up the faith-based initiative in the White House, mm -hmm. it's been an open question. Mm -hmm. um, I'm wondering what both of you think about it very quickly. Mm -hmm. Well, I, like, I, I think I stated earlier before, uh, it's, uh, we're already paying for it. You know, we got tax exempt status. Churches enjoy it, so the, so the government is already paying for religion in this country. The minor thing is, what is the public getting out of for their money? Uh, I think face, you know, uh, providing those services, you know, the, I, I went, to, I, I've actually been to Osborne, but I actually, but I went through Fortune instead, because uh, I wasn't, I didn't have family, I didn't have the children and stuff like that, so you know, it was different. But um, it's usually how that ties in, and you know, if you support the tie-in, you know, I come out, I don't know nobody, I haven't been in society for a year, I'm, I'm actually like a Martian, just landed on Earth. I know everything, but I don't know anything. And I need to be connected to programs. And it's always good to have someone, at least from the religious point of view, saying, well, you know, maybe you should examine that. Let me ask Kimora very quickly what you're feeling about that. Well, I think the faith-based organizations are, are vital. They, they fill a gap that we haven't dealt with in the past. And I think it's great if, if people can uh, see that connection because again, it's just one more way for a person who's going, uh, coming out of prison to feel connected somewhere. So they're not just dumped out there. Okay, thanks to both of you sure. for a very good discussion. Expanding faith-based initiatives is one of a number of ideas circulating among criminologists to bring reforms to our troubled criminal justice system. No one claims it's the only answer. But after an election in which the tough issues of crime and punishment hardly rated a mention during the campaign, maybe it's time for Americans to come up with bold ideas to change our status as the world's biggest jailer. Maybe we all need a leap of faith. I'm Steve Handler. Thanks for watching, and see you next time.